today I want to talk about a few things, um, but in the main, about uh, how we can make decisions. And uh, to lead into this, um, I would like to share a few stories and some of my experience, which may seem as if it is going in another direction, but it will pull together, I assure you, <laughs> as it usually does. Now, I'll start off with a little Zen story. And this one is, uh, a nun asks the great master Zhao Shu, what is a deep, a deeply secret mind? What is the, the deep depth to your mind? And Zhao Xu takes her hand and he squeezes it. He squeezes it tightly. And the nun says to him, do you still have this? Do you still hold this? And Zhao Xu says, you are the one who has this. Now, Zen stories are always a little difficult on the surface to understand. But the thisness or the tatta, the thusness in, um, in the Pali tradition, the, the thus, tatta, tattagaba, the thus one has come. That thusness is the pure essential part of who we are and what makes the moment to moment decisions in our life, which goes beyond our ordinary everyday thinking mind. But all share a few situations that I recall my hand being squeezed tightly to start with. One which I think I have shared this story but I'll relay again was by my teacher, my monk master, Master Kusan, when shortly before he passed away he led myself and another nun sister up the mountain to the site that became my hermitage, which you saw in the video slides last month. And at that time it was just a forest. And we were asked to bring shovels and boots and gloves and asked to dig. He said, dig there, which made no sense because the forest was thick with roots and I'm trying to dig very hard rock and soil and getting a little bit frustrated that I wasn't going anywhere with this <laughs> this effort. And then after about half an hour, he, and he asked me to dig in a few places. He says, I'm really tired. Can you please carry me down the mountain? Now we're talking about a 20 minute walk down that mountain. And I look at this little sort of plump man and I look at the other nun, so I pass her the shovels and he grabs my hand, you know, so he's putting his whole 70 plus body entrusting it on this 20 something year old girl, <laughs> 30 year old girl. And that was the only time he ever touched my hand, but he held it tightly for a moment and then I lifted him up on my back. And while he held my hand, I carried him down that mountain. And I remember the strength in that hand, the confidence, the security, the, uh, the mind in that hand that allowed me to do that. And when we got down the mountain, I put him down Little like the story of the monk who carries the woman across the, the water and puts her down on the other side, but the disciple continues to carry her on in his mind. A similar story, never thought anything about it, other than I was relieved to have got him down that little tiny, windy, steep track. The next time I recall 
somebody squeezing my hand was that 102-year-old nun who squeezed my hand and grabbed me and pulled me under the blanket when she heard that I was a coaching, a big nose. She couldn't see me properly, so she squeezed my hand, pulled me close to her, looked at me closely and laughed. And as she squeezed my hand and brought it to her, she said, let's become enlightened together. I always remember this as she's rolling her black and white beads in the other hand. Let's become enlightened together. We're not different. We're deeply connected. We're deeply entrenched in this path together. So let's go the final yard. And the third time was my nun teacher when I saw her on the last trip. Now, she was 86 then, so she must be close to 88 now. And as I was leaving, I mean, she was a not a touchy-feely person <laughs> in any way. But she stretched her hand out and she took my hand very gently. I recall the hand was quite fragile, even though she looks fairly strong. And she held it tightly and looked at me and said, come back soon. Again, that, you know, my whole really adult life in knowing this motherly figure who has taught me many things on the path. Again, that deep connection in that tender, gentle squeeze of her hand in mine. So those three incidences came to mind when I read this koan, this story about the nun and Jashu and the nun's inquiry. Because when somebody holds you in that way, now for a couple it may be in a hug or a mother to the child in, in a gentle hug, it is something quite intimate. It is something that touches you very deeply beyond your ideas and thoughts about the situation. You just feel deeply connected. And so here, the nun is concerned or incurious as to the great master in this moment, in this hold, in this touch. But the master puts it back onto her and I'll take you to another story here. <clears throat> this is a Theravada story about the great venerable Sariputta, the most profound, wise and meditative monk, uh, disciple of the Buddha. And another great venerable, venerable Arunuda, Ruda, sorry, Anuruda. Anuruda, thank you, who had great psychic powers. And this is a conversation between these two great monks. Now, at this time, Venerable Ananuruddha was not enlightened. And he goes to the Venerable Sariputta. And he says, uh, With the divine eye fully developed and purified, I can see into the 10,000 universes, 10,000 worlds. He could see into distant existences, as did the Buddha, and understood how they came into existence. My meditation is established in mindfulness. It is strong and steady, and I have unbounded energy, which is what meditation can bring for you. But he says, however, my mind is still not free of conflict and confusion. And Sariputta replies, Venerable, your ability with your divine seeing into the world systems is connected to your conceit. There is still conceit. There is still a self, an I, in this understanding. There's subtle sense of achievement.
And then he points to his stability of body and the one-pointed meditation and his firm mindfulness. And he says these have grown out of restlessness and anxiety. And it is for this reason your heart is not yet free from defilements. So, you know, when we go to retreats, even coming here today, even when we sit down, we are wanting to free ourselves from the restlessness of our mind. We're wanting to still the mind. We're wanting to gain some sense of peace. But here, the Venerable Sariputta says, still, this is because you are not free of your defilement. And what he asks him to do, which is the point here that relates to my other story, he says, it is better, Venerable Anuruddha, that you do not concern yourself with these achievements. Do not concern yourself with your states of meditation, your states of power, perception, your subtle states of mind, your capacity to go into deep jhana. Do not concern yourself with these, but turn your attention to the state of deathlessness. Turn into that place where all other is severed. All roots of attachment, all roots of I are severed. And this he does, and he soon accomplishes the liberation he was so seeking. The same as the great Master Zhao Zhu, when he points to the nun, do not look outside to the teacher's accomplishments to the teacher's capacities, others' capacities, but turn that mind in to the very root of where this is coming from, where this thusness springs from, the sense of I, where does that come from? Both are pointing directly to where there is no more attachment, no more accomplishments, no more birth and death. And rather than engaging in all that we know, we've achieved, we've understood in this life, turn to what is unborn. Turn that mind into the unborn. And I was reflecting on what has deceased, what has been completed, and the decisions made by me whilst I was ill. I was lying there and I was thinking about the me in this situation and the me done that and the me that. <laughs> but the, the me actually in this moment was just lying there quite helpless in front of the fire on the couch for a week or so. And I could see very clearly, you know, all those decisions, all those wonderful, you know, experiences in my life and the path, this path that led to that path. It actually only fruited in this moment of my <laughs> head down, turning the mind inward. As the Buddha said, you know well what leads you forward and what holds you back. So choose the path that leads to wisdom. How not acting out of purely personal needs, selfish needs, and not in regards to comparing what I have or I don't 
or what others have or don't. And also, look into the stains of our ill will, our regret, our fears. And is there some wisdom and kindness that has grown out of this? So, you know, even when we look, when I was contemplating, you know, really the impermanence of the body, really the instability of health. And this is only still a relatively mild illness to what might come, but at times I felt not in control of my mind, my body. <laughs> but it gave me the capacity to look into the causes because the conditions of that is what creates the decisions of the future. We often come to our life, and this is where I want to start to talk about our decision-making. We often come to these crossroads in our life, and often people come to me to talk about their issues, their problems. They rarely come to have a cup of tea and tell me all the joys of their life. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> they come to, they knock on the door or they drive a, an hour or two to come and sit down and regurgitate all their problems. And we all do this. But it's interesting. In listening and allowing them to speak and allowing them to process what has happened for them in the past, it allows space them to be more present and let go. It is the only way, in a way, that when we sit in meditation, after we have a rush of thoughts about what went on five minutes ago, the day ago, a week ago, and that starts to settle, the waves of all our immediate conflicts start to settle. The next layer is a sense of presence, a sense of just being on the cushion, being here with those thoughts, being here with those feelings. But what makes the difference in any decision or any situation that we're trying to understand is that capacity to become very still and present with it. It is only in that, only in that awareness that takes hold of this moment that we come to accept what has happen, the conditions that have arisen for this situation to happen. When it's a big decision, and I have a couple of big decisions in my mind, in my life, I find there is such a rush of information and I start to want to work it out. I start researching, which is what most of us do we start to research the options, we start to gather information, and I'm an enormous information gatherer, as you may have noticed. <laughs> but I start to inquire to, into all the possibilities, maybe even look for others to, you know, offer their support and their ideas. But then what happens at the end of it? I usually get such a head full, I just drop it. For a few days, I do nothing. I suddenly realise that I can't work it out in just my thoughts. 
I can start to become more attentive to what has to be done now. I start to apply myself to the very current and present situations that are demanding my attention, which are often quite domestic, quite ordinary. And for the next few days, I engage in where I am and what I am doing now. And with the strength of meditation, the mindfulness, the presence of awareness allows me to, to do that. But I also realise that there are other undercurrents of belief, undercurrents of perceptions about who I should be or what I should be doing that are feeding this, this uncontrived mass, you might say, of what we call a doubt, an uncertainty, a restlessness. There's some other notions of self that are very ingrained in all behaviours and patterns that are just like the fish under the sea moving in the water and just influencing the subtle states of emotion. And I reflected on these words by uh, Sylvia Borstein who said of the past events, from where we stand now, it could not have been otherwise. It's quite interesting. Where we actually stand now are due to all the conditions that have brought us to this particular moment and to the many choices that we face, the many tiny decisions throughout a day that lead us to who we are right now. From where we stand now, it could not have been otherwise. The causes and conditions that lead to an event form its result. This is cause and effect. So it could not be otherwise. Our only choice is to recognise and release to recognise it and let it go. The only place the karma, the, um, you can say the stain or the fruit of karma is experienced and released is now. The Buddha talked about this a lot. He didn't say run away. Turn away, ignore. He said, be with it. Be with the beautiful, the tender, the intimate. And be with that which is difficult and suffering and confusing. <clears throat> because there is the place it expires. When we turn away, it infests, it manifests, and it grows. The ignorance grows if we turn away. But when we turn into it, we recognise it. It is extinguished. It's finished. It's only, of course, with the complete cessation, such as... the great venerables who have become enlightened, when they turn back from all that they think they are and have attained and gained, that they go into the essential. The wisdom takes them into that moment that is severing it all. We often find that we uh, sort of fall and fit into the places we're in. <laughs> we just sort of 
you know, somehow stumble on what we're doing every day, as if we just fall into it or it just absorbs us, dominates us. Some of us jump in feet first and then ask questions later. <laughs> or like me, the information gatherer who loves to discuss and deliberate and debate. <laughs> and all of these are sort of a subtle form of avoidance. They're somehow just making us, uh, you know, allow things to happen, so to speak, as if they're happening from somewhere else, by someone else. Yeah. Many of us would sin simply just not rather have to make choices. So we allow the other, the choice maker in the family. These days it seems to be the four and five year olds. Have you noticed? <laughs> My little grand nephews and nieces seem to be making all the choices and decisions in the family when I go there. And I'm just stunned. The parents are, okay, okay, you know, <laughs> as if they're trying to brush all the problems onto their little children. <laughs> and the children have already learnt to manipulate what works at a very young age. Whichever approach we take on the world, it does not offer much in return. Because if we're all the time wanting something, we know the world does not necessarily um, produce in a way just for me. We don't always get exactly what we're wanting. We meditate and we think and we concentrate. You know, there's all these very wonderful New Age ways to manifest. But is that what we really want? The unwise wait for a lucky day, but every day is a lucky day for the diligent man. It's words of the Buddha. Every day Every situation is extremely fortunate. And why? The fact you can see me. I can see you. This is miraculous. This is the true miracle. The fact I can have some a little bit of perhaps confidence or you know, a little bit of wisdom in the path, a tiny little bit. I can share a little bit with others. This is, you know, any other twi slight twist and turn as I shared in my last talk. So many things that took me from this place in my life to that place in my life to that place in my life to meet this person to meet that person. It could have gone any number of other ways. I could have just said today, oh, I'm just really not feeling too well. I don't think I'll come in. Yesterday, Padmini called me and she said, oh, Jigwang, I heard you're not so well. Perhaps you shouldn't come in. And it would have been very easy. I had two appointments yesterday and I, I said no to them. It would have been very easy to stay, you know, by that fire. And then this would not have happened. So those little tiny choices create by a lot of effort and a lot of decision making. It is a way of making decisions where we can flow and find a consistency in our life. And how do we do that? I've given a few hints today where every day we feel alive and unstuck. To have the capacity, as I said before, to be with what works and what doesn't work and engage in the 
thisness of this situation now. Then we don't have time for comparative. I always recall when I had big decisions to make. As I said before in that process of doing the research and letting them go and observing if there is fear involved or anxiety or deep emotions. When I actually had decisions to make after my three-month retreats, where would I go next? Would I go back to my temple? Would I do some social work? Would I go and do some study? I would just let it be until the last day. The last day of meditation where we were washing our bedding, we were preparing ourselves to go. That last day I would be clear about where I was going next. And I learned to trust that. I'm not sure I've held that uh, tremendous uh, belief since I've been back in more recent years, but there I always trusted it. And I want to give another little story. I was going to read a poem by one of my dear uh, monk brothers. And this is about while papering the window. Yesterday I papered the window by myself on a day with a little wind. As I prepared the windows, my mind was luminescent. Not a single speck of dust, no other thoughts. You can actually experience what this state of unperturbed mind feels like. As the fresh sunbeams illuminated the newly papered windows, the inside of the room looked conspicuously more neat and tidy. In the late afternoon, as I sat alone in my empty room, looking out at the pure and cosy sunlight, brightening the newly laid window paper, my mind is full. I cannot even begin to put it into words. Through the opening space of the clear, transparent life, I'm about to become freshly happy. <laughs> and I picked this little poem after I started to reflect about a few things. It's a very simple action, a very simple space, as you saw in the pictures. But Korean rooms are papered from floor to roof, from windows to doors. And usually about once every two years, maybe three years, we may paper the whole room. We might do the windows more often, usually once a year, or the doors. But we would start with the floor and we'd remove this old waxy paper off the concrete, lay fresh underlay of paper. Now this underlay paper, I've made it before. It's made from a mulberry bark and it's a very thin layer of paper that has a, a size in it. And we would paste that down, make a, a glue from... Um, from uh, mostly just flour and water, a little bit, maybe a little bit of a P PVC or something. And we would paste this underlay down, then we would have these big sheets of this waxed paper. And it took a little bit of precision, but you would start at the floor, and when the waxed paper was down, you would varnish it. Now, sometimes we did that with just a, a natural product, which was made from soybean, boil up soybeans, makes a beautiful natural varnish. And we would paste that and the floor would be heated. So it was very warm. So the whole process was a lot about touch, how it felt. So you'd lay the floor and then you might do the wallpaper. Now we're just talking about small rooms. So we would do it all in a day usually. We'd do the wallpaper and the wallpaper were long strips of a, usually a white, sometimes with a slight little pattern on it, wallpaper. And then the room became very new, that newness, freshness, the smell. Sometimes we did the ceiling, sometimes we didn't. Um, but again, that was papered. And then we would do the door. And just like Pop Chung Sin would explain, you have to, it takes a long time actually to do the door, <laughs> longer than anything else really, because you have to scrape off. All the doors had these little square wooden windows 
and the old paper sticks to it all. So we'd have to spray it and scrape it off. And it's a very sort of intimate personal process of touch and observation. You know, if you don't lay the paper, you paint the glue on the back of the paper and then you have to lay it very flat with a dry brush, brush it down. And as you're doing it, that a luminous glow that comes through. See, once that's severed, once there's a little bird's punctured a hole in there or your finger's gone through it, it no longer has that clarity. But when you first paper the doors, and I can tell you they often last about two days <laughs> before something penetrates it. <laughs> it, the light just flows in. And you know, summer or winter, 10, 15 degrees below, we just have papered windows, papered doors, and a heated floor. And it's very connecting. You feel totally at ease in that room. After you've papered it, your mind is very fresh, very present, and you just sit looking out at that. <laughs> it's a meditation to just look out at those little luminous squares as the sunlight changes over the door. And the evening, evening comes and you still have a glow, especially if it's a moonlight because the paper's white. And the room is white. The only thing that's warm is, warmer colour is uh, the floor. So there's not so much thinking in this process and it is just dealing with this activity in a very meditative way, a very connecting way. It's like that squeezing of the hand. It's the squeezing of making the floor flat, the walls flat, the doors paper flat, without ripples. And the mind has a capacity to flow. Just be present and flow. A sound comes. The light changes. A bell rings. And the mind just flows. And how can we do that in our sort of modern everyday complexities of life? We need to understand and recognise our emotions and our thoughts. We don't turn away from them. But we let go of trying to make things other than they are. Admittedly, we would sort of try to make things perfect. But in Korean, compared to Japanese, nothing's perfect. You know, Korean lines of houses, everything bows and just depends on the shape of the timber and and the floors are often a bit ripply and, and you go to Japan and everything is absolutely perfect and you know the width of timber beyond the paper is exactly you know to that measurement from roof to floor and you go to Korea and the eye just sort of goes around <laughs> has a capacity to sort of and you'd sort of say think when I first went, I'd think, what is that piece of wood coming out of the floor in that corner? <laughs> For some reason, they had cut a piece of wood and added another piece. And rather than cut the piece of wood back, they just let it enter the room. Or when you've got a rock, rather than flatten the rock, which they do more now, if the rock went like that, then they would just shape the piece of wood to the rock. You'd think you'd shape the... <laughs> The rock to the piece of wood, but no, there was, so there is a beauty in that. There's interest. The eye flows, doesn't get to a corner and stop. It flows, and nature is like that, and our life is like that. If we can actually see the beauty in the complexities and the difficulties and the decision making. We can actually rise to the challenges. Then the eye flows, the mind flows, and it becomes engaging, interesting. 
So in that, we let go of a lot of things that we think it should be otherwise. Yet we are still awkward in hundreds of ways, clumsy in thousands. Still I go on, is another Zen saying. Still I go on. Still the I continues to look. The ear can sounds we reach out for. In Zen meditation, it fosters a willingness to be with the unknown and an opening of the gates of perception, a posture that is firm and alert but not stiff or closed off. It can enter into flexible places and it is possible to chart a wise course from moment to moment. You know, water, when it flows down, It by itself charters a wise course by the nature of its flow. When a boulder is in the water, it just flows around. When sand banks up, it just flows over. When the water has some momentum, some power, it just makes the river in its own way. It makes its own course. It is the same in our life. In regard to the decisions and the junctions in our life, we need to realise we are always, at this point, meeting the world, meeting each other. In all the junctions, all the complexities, all the difficulties, we are meeting it right here. They define the trail that we have left behind. The definition is only in this. The rest is a faded memory, a story. But it's defined now. What I'm saying to you now is what you're hearing. What I've said, you can't even remember a minute ago, so... Thank goodness. (laughs) Who would want to carry all this on to the rest of the day? (laughs) But what is important to recall is all there. And when you need it, it just bubbles up to the surface. So going back to what I said, when I put everything down after all the research and letting go of my selfish concerns and fears, what happens is all sorts of possibilities that you've already understood which way to go, how to do it. They bubble up to the surface and you know what to do. No psychologist can tell you. No shrink can tell you. No Buddhist master can tell you. They can only point to you you to look in the right place. I can't tell you anything you don't know. If you're looking pretty sad, then you know there's a lot of things there that are obviously not touching home. The wall is fairly thick. So we think our decisions are incredibly important and many of them do reverberate in consequences. But in truth, most aren't such a big deal. (laughs) Given space and time, we can see this. I don't know if you've ever looked back at all your traumas and sadness. We all do from time to time. But then as we grow a little older, a little wiser, they make sense. It all makes sense. I've often been with people in the last moments of their life and they will say, I would not have done it any differently. It makes total sense now. 
So when we're in the bogmire of it all, our legs are stuck into the mud and we can't feel we're moving anywhere. <laughs> Those nightmarish dreams we have. Then later we see that was a moment to stop. More important than what happens is life. is how it happens. It's not about the wealth, the problems we're having or not having, but is how we engage, how we do it. And in that, how do we connect? When we touch, squeeze the hand of another, and it's often that image of a father with his young child squeezing the hand to bring them along together with him. There is that tremendous sense of offering security, offering aid, supporting the growth and the development of another. But in ourself, when we offer that to ourself, which is the point, the point of Sariputta, pointing it back, the point of the Master Jashu to the nun, pointing it back into ourself, then how do we embrace our own life, our own practice, and nourish our own wisdom and compassion? This is the main point. Because it's only from here then we connect with others. It is only from the, the point of Nibbana or the point of liberation is the peace it brings. Is the unfettered mind it brings to others, to this world. And that's the greatest message of the Buddha. The rest, the Buddha had many decisions to make. And he allowed them to happen gradually. The decisions of ordaining nuns. Of, you know, ten years after the Buddha started to gather disciples, he created rules a long time after. Didn't happen. He didn't just sort of say, okay, now you shave your head and now you do this and this. It happened over many years where he could see the human heart was creating still a lot of conflict, the human attachments and greed. And so as we actually start to be clearer in ourselves, then the decisions are not so much a decisive matter. It is a matter of what connects more deeply in taking us from this moment to the next. And what it is out of this that brings kindness and compassion to others. And although we often regard the self as a very main focus in our resolves, and self-cherishing is, is very deeply rooted, still we can consider from a very deep still mind the means that will have infinite repercussions. It is only from entering thisness, entering the suchness or the thusness in this moment that we really connect. So I'll leave it there and thank you all for listening so carefully.